I'm very bad with software. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I'm Greg, and today I will be ranting about Ruby. I will be complaining about all the features that I don't like. Uh, there's plenty of them, but I chose just 10, because there is no time for more. And I, I'm not a hater. I use Ruby for six years, and I like this language. But like every single language, it has its problems. And it has big problems. Like for example, it has this thing called nil. And no language should have the thing called nil. But Ruby has it, and it's a huge problem. And I could talk about it for hours. Uh, but I will focus today on more simple and smaller issues that, in my opinion, Ruby shouldn't have. But they are, they are there, and they are actually called features. So I want to have this presentation a bit interactive. So I'll be writing some code, and I want to ask you what this code will, will return, OK? So let's start with something basic. What this code will return? What? Better? What? Yeah, this code. Do you know what it will return? Anyone? No. No. One divided by two will return one. Come on. Come on. <laughs> it returns zero. <laughs> it's so obvious. OK. <laughs> I hope this one will be easier. Even beer? Oh, wait. Maybe. Uh, OK. Now better. So. Math dot square root for those who can't read. Yeah, so square root from 4, what will it return? Yes. <laughs> OK, now, tricky one. Square root from minus 1, what will it return? Uh, oh, yes, of course, error. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now, I do some magic. I'm requir requiring a math library for Ruby. It's there. And now, what will return this code? Zero. Nah. It returns rational, which is one of two. Now, what will require this code? Yes. <laughs> and what will require this code? What will it return? Yes, it's I. So the MathN library adds uh, plenty of possibilities for Ruby, but it also changes the default behavior that you expect. So normally, when you divide integers, you expect it to return 0. And of course, if you require MathN yourself, then you know what will happen. But now imagine that in your gem file, you have a gem that depends on another gem that depends on another gem that requires MathN. And then suddenly, all your operations or your integer divisions stop working. And it's not just a problem that I imagined. I checked on GitHub, and there are at least like 10 different issues with different gems that people complain, oh, I added your gem, and now all my tests are failing. And the usual response is like, oh, it's your problem, not mine. <laughs> so yeah, so there is, this, there is this gem called Ruby units that allows you to convert various units, like miles to kilometers, et cetera. And it requires MathN because of the precision. And because of that, people who want to use this gem usually have problems later with integer division. So the solution for that is to do something like this. So now it works like expected. But no one, no one thinks about it, because no one thinks that, oh, maybe some gem will require this obscure library. OK, now another thing. Uh. OK, cloning objects. So this is thing that I, uh, that I that is really annoying, because we have two different methods in Ruby that are, that are called very similarly. One is called clone, and one is called dupe. And now, let's do this. Mm. OK, so I've required this, this code. I've got just cl class user, and I've got module admin. And now I have u equals user. Of course, oh, no, it's not a user. Huh, that's interesting. Yes, <laughs> OK user.new. So now, uh, it is a user. Is it an admin? It's not an admin. 
Now I do user.extend admin. Now I've got the same user, but it is also an admin. So I just, this one single object is an admin. And now I do freeze. Uh, it doesn't have it. Freeze. OK, yeah. So I've frozen this object, so I can't modify it. So this object is an admin, and it's frozen. I can't modify it. I can't add any mod more modules to this object. And now I do user.clone. Uh, you see equals user.clone. Now you see is a user. Of course, it's an user. Now the question is, is, is it an admin? If I clone the object, is it still an admin or not? Who thinks it is an admin? Nobody. Two people. <laughs> Who thinks it's not an admin anymore? Nobody. Oh, one person. OK. The rest is still thinking. OK, so if I clone the object, it is still an admin. And if I clone the object, it is uh, it's frozen. It is still frozen. But now I've got another object, which is duplication of user. And this object, obviously, is a user. But it's not, oh, uh, sorry, it's UD, yeah. <laughs> so it's not an admin. It is a user. And is it frozen? No, it's not frozen. So the difference between these two methods is not obvious. If you think about these words like duplicate and clone, you think of them as synonyms. But it, in, in Ruby, they have very different uh, very different consequences. So this is something that I do not like because it's not explicit. Whatever I use, if I use duplicate or, free, uh, or clone, the name of this method doesn't tell me that the object will actually change, that we, it will not be an admin anymore. Next one. OK, so in Ruby, we've got instance variables that are uh, prefixed with single at character and class variables that are prefixed with two at uh, at characters. So now, okay. So I've got class A, and I do something like instance variable get. Correct. I think so. Okay. What what will return this code? Which number? Three. Three? Anyone agrees, disagrees? It returns one. So and now if I do a dot new dot instance variable get, it returns three. Which means that instance variable for the class and for the instance of this class is different thing. Now let's do a dot class variable get. OK, what will this return? Two or four? Uh, no, it returns four. So the class variable for the class and for its instance is the same thing. But instance variable for the class and its instances is different thing. Now, now we've got class B, which inherits from class A. And now we do the same. Let's say that we call b dot class variable get. What will it return? Will it return? No. This returns. This returns five. Now, what this will return? It returns five, because we wrote another class that inherits from a, and it uses the class variable which is shared among the whole tree of of classes. And now, if we do uh, p dot instance okay, uh, this everyone knows what it will return. Yes, it returns six, and this one ah, it returns nil. So once again, if you have single at character, it's only in the same class. It's not shared among any, 
any other classes. And you have the, if you have double add character, it's class variable, it's shared everywhere. The, con the conclusion is don't use it, because <laughs> you will have a lot of surprises. Uh, now, aliases. So we've got these two methods to add alias in Ruby. One is called alias, and the other is called alias method. And they are basically, uh, they seem the same. So one looks like this, alias method. Then we uh, say the new name, and then after the comma, uh, old name. And in alias, we do not have to do, uh, we do not have to use the comma. The difference is that alias is a keyword in Ruby, and alias method is just a normal method which you can override. So now. Let's check how they both work. Uh, let me just switch. OK, so that you see better. So we've got two classes. One is vehicle, and one is a car. And now car inherits from vehicle. When you ask for type of a car, it takes the, uh, the method from, from its parent and then adds a car. And then when you ask for a size, it, it does the same. The difference is that for, for size, I've got alias method. And for type, I've got only alias. So now let's say I've got new car, and I ask for its type. So it says vehicle is car. Now, I did an alias. So alias should behave exactly this way, the same way. So you expect that car new dot kind will also return that vehicle is a car, but it's not. And if you do this with alias method, so if we ask about the size, it says that size is big. And if we ask about dimension, it says the same. So alias method will call the method from the child, which I do here uh, in the size. But if you do an alias, it will not call the method from the from the child, it will call the method from the parent. Once again, just like in previous case, you've got two methods that are called almost exactly the same, but their behavior is different in certain cases. I don't like it because it's not explicit. I don't know that alias is only attached to the parent and that alias method uh, also works on the child. Next one is logical operators. OK, so I guess most of you know that in Ruby, we've got two types of logical operators. One is end end, uh, with like the end with ampersands, uh, for example, and the other is just the word end. And obviously, you know that their behavior, despite the fact that we use the same name to describe them, is, is different. So we've got, uh, sorry. So test one is this method. Anyone knows what it will return? return 7. And the other one? 42. The other one, it will return 42, yes. So the difference is that ampersand, the double ampersand behaves like this. x, x equals this, while the other one behaves this way. So the problem here is that, once again, we've got something that looks very similar that you would expect expect it to behave the same way, but it's different. And now you can, you can check it also uh, in this case. Like if, you, if I run test three, I'm, running a run uh, I'm raising a runtime error because the behavior is like this. And if I do test four, it will not raise an error because the behavior is like this. So the Ruby style guide that is uh, used by the community says that you shouldn't use this or and and at all, that you should just ignore them. Uh, for me, it's not really, I don't use them as logical operators. I use them for control flow. But many, many people do not know the difference. So whenever I see the code that uses both of these uh, constructions, I always think if the programmer is aware of its, of its effects or not. That's why I prefer to keep using one of them and just use parentheses whenever, whenever it's needed. 
Uh, next one is for loop. Has anyone here ever used for loop in Ruby? <laughs> ever? A few people. OK. I use it once. <laughs> it's here. This is the one, uh, this is the one that, uh, that I'm using it. Uh, the reason why I'm not using for loop is because it has some unexpected behavior. <coughs> OK. So we've got test for loop. So if I run test iterator, what it will do, uh, I need dot new. It will raise an error because the J variable is not, is not available. It is, de it is defined here inside this block, and its scope is limited to, to this block. But the for loop doesn't care. So I do test for, and it returns me a number. So the thing is that even though it looks like the same begging end block, the difference is that it doesn't have a new lexical scope. So it's, it's the same scope, and it introduces a lot of confusion. And the only case that I see people using the for loop is when people come from JavaScript or Java or in other languages. In Ruby, it's not really uh, very common because of, because of this problem. Now, oh, this is my favorite. So you've got this uh, methods protection, right? You've got three levels of, uh, of methods availability. There is public method, protected method, and private method. And in all of the languages that I knew before, all object-oriented languages, the semantics of private, protected, and public is exactly the same, except for Ruby. So now we'll, we'll check how, how behave private methods. Uh, mm -hmm. OK, works. So I've got class called private parent. I've got this class, and I've got a new object. So OK, I've got this object, and it has a few methods. So the first method is check A. Check A, obviously will return uh, the variable a that I defined here. And I've got public attribute accessor for this method. So of course, it, it returns 1. Now, since the attribute accessor for the variable b is private, as you can expect, it will, tell, it will return an error. And now it's the same with, uh, with setters, right? If I say, set a, what it, what it should do, of course, it should, it should set this variable, right? It should set a. And now if I do check a, it will return the new value. And if I do the same with b, what I expect is an error, right? Because b is private method, and I can't call it with the, with the self uh, prefix. So I can't call self.b because it's private, except that I can because it's an exception. That totally doesn't make sense when you think about it at first. Uh, but then you realize that if my accessor is private, and if I'm not able to use self, if I write something like this, instead of defining the, instead of assigning the number four to my variable b, I will just create a local variable. So because of that, Ruby has this one, only one exception. Only for access uh, for writers for assigning the variable, you can use self dot private method. And now, uh, if you have private child, this object in languages like Java or uh, C++ wouldn't have access to any uh, private methods, so it wouldn't have access to set B. Because in that languages, a uh, child has only access to public and protected methods of its, of its parent. Uh, but in Ruby, this semantics is different. Now we've got protected methods. Which, I, which behave also entirely different than in other languages. So if I have protected parent, 
and if I have, if I have protected uh, new, let's say one, and I have protected child, so I've got these two variables: protected child inherits from protected parent. Now I can call something like uh, protected child compare arc with protected parent, and it works. Even though this method arc here is protected, and I'm calling it on the other object, which normally wouldn't work because uh, because it's a protected method, right? The difference is that in Ruby you can call protected methods on any other object that is in the same tree that is inheriting or its object of the same class. Why I don't like this feature is because it's confusing if you ever written any code in any other object-oriented language. So whenever someone uses protected in the code, I'm wondering if they really mean, mean it to be protected, if they know what's the difference between protected and private, or if they don't know either and they just copied this code from Stack Overflow. OK. The last one I've got is block syntax. So we've got two syntaxes for block, and it's either curly braces or it's do end. And you would expect that they are exactly the same, but of course they're not. So we've got this. So we've got block syntax. OK, so we've got two methods here. Uh, one uses curly braces, and the other one uses do end. And they're exactly the same, except that one uses curly braces, the other uses, the other uses do end. So it's curly braces, it's this method. Any idea what this will return? <coughs> so this will return an error. That's because Ruby thinks that when you're using block uh, the curly braces, you're doing something like this. So for you, when you read this code, it seems obvious that no, this is not what I mean. But curly braces behave this way. And if you have exactly the same code, but instead you use do end, this works. So now, why this is confusing? Because because this method, these curly braces, it can still work. Like, if the method val2 will return something different than 0. So if we do curly braces 2, it will return minus 4. You might think that it doesn't make sense. But imagine that you see this code like this. So it's method val2 that accepts some block. And this method, what it returns for me, it's a symbol of minus. So if you do something like this, obviously it will reduce with minus, so 1 minus 2 is minus 1, minus 3 is minus 4. And then if you try to, r to use this val2 variable, but with curly braces, it will raise an error. So uh, I think this is all what I've got. Let me check. Oh, no. There is one more. There is one more that I really, really hate. Uh, so this is the syntax of, of the methods with exclamation mark in the end. So obviously, when you've got string like str and you do sub as we replace with z, it will return us uh, the changed, changed object. But it will not modify the string itself. To show it to you better, let's do it like this. Mm. So it returns me modified string, but the string itself is the same. It's different when we do it with sub. The string was changed. But now, if I call this str sub same, it returns me nil. Why? Because there was no letter s. There was nothing to replace in that first string. So it returns nil. So for me, this is extremely confusing, because I don't know that it will return me nil. Like, why, why would it? It should return me the modified value, right? And this modified value is basically the same as the original value. The reason why it behaves this way 
is so that I can do something like if string sub then zero else one. So I can do something like this. So I, I understand the concept. I understand why it's done this way. Uh, but this is something that, once again, is very confusing. And when I see the code like this, I'm always curious. I'm always very suspicious if this is something that, uh, that the developer intended to use or if they don't know that it has these confusing consequences. OK, I think that's all for me today. Uh, despite all this, all this stuff, where is the camera? I still love Ruby. I still like this language. I'm not a hater. It's just, obviously, it could be better, like, like any other language. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>